Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So the case that I have for you all today is quite a doozy. It will make you want to scream and it's so disturbing to hear everything that has happened in this case and nothing was done and still to this day, nothing has been done. There is so little coverage on this case that besides their own family talking about it, I haven't really seen any reports on this case at all. So I wanted to make sure I made this video talk about this case so that everybody knows what happened and maybe with enough push, if we make enough waves, that something may happen in this case. I do want to say as a disclaimer, everything I say in this video is alleged, none of it is confirmed. It is all my opinion or information that I found on a public websites or articles. None of it is pure fact, nor am I stating it as such. I am simply using my platform to deliver information that has been alleged by the people involved in this case. With that being said, today we are going to be discussing the death of Grant Solomon and the ongoing abuse of Gracie Solomon. This case starts with Grant and Gracie's mother, Angie. Angie grew up in a household that was less than ideal. However, through that, she was able to persevere. She grew up playing basketball and she had a beautiful singing voice. She went on to get her bachelor's degree and then her doctorate in pharmacy. After that, she bought her own home and she was on her way to living a fulfilling, amazing life and having an amazing career. However, as an adult in 2001, Angie became reacquainted with a boy that she knew from high school, a man named Aaron Solomon. At the time, Aaron had been a sports anchor for WSMV4, the NBC news affiliate for Nashville, Tennessee. The two quickly began a relationship, and only six weeks after, Angie became pregnant with Grant, who was born on June 13th, 2002. After this, she felt that she really had no choice but to marry Aaron. She said that her parents pressured her to marry Aaron so that her baby would have a father, even though she fully intended on raising Grant on her own. Either way, she did become married after being in a relationship for about two months. Then, four years later, on October 17, 2006, Angie gave birth to her second child, a daughter named Gracie. Growing up, Grant was described as being an upbeat, talented young boy. He was close to his mother and especially his little sister, Gracie. He saw himself as a protector to his little sister and his mother. He started playing baseball when he was only four years old, and the baseball field was basically his sanctuary. He grew into a talented baseball pitcher who was being recruited by Division I schools when he was in high school. He was popular in school, and he was described as a very loyal friend. However, pretty much immediately after Angie and Aaron had Grant, the relationship between them became very, very tumultuous. She reported that throughout this entire time, Aaron had many violent outbursts. He was manipulative and did whatever he could to keep her under his control. He cheated on her numerous times as well during all of this. By 2008, Angie allegedly found out that not only was Aaron involved in multiple affairs, but she alleges that he was grooming several underage girls and hiring sex workers. By 2011, it was said that Aaron willingly stepped down from his job as a sports anchor. However, Angie alleges that he was actually fired after inappropriate content was found on his computer and his phone. By 2014, he became a financial advisor for the investment management firm Merrill Lynch. Throughout all of the abuse and issues that Angie was facing, Angie said that she tried attending therapy, but she said that Aaron refused to give her any sort of privacy. He would try to come with and listen in on the sessions, and he wouldn't really let her be alone for any extended amount of time. Eventually, after a few sessions with the therapist, Erin joined the therapy sessions with her, and Angie said that she was diagnosed with PTSD from all of the abuse that she had suffered all throughout her life, including when she was a child, and allegedly Erin was diagnosed with narcissism and sex addiction. Some reports say that even though he was abusive all throughout the relationship, it was said that after Gracie was born, there was even a bigger shift. Aaron seemed angry all of the time, especially towards Grant and Angie. Then, by early January of 2013, 
five-year-old little Gracie went to her mother with some horrifying allegations. So, for a period prior, Aaron would not allow Angie to give Gracie baths, only he could give her baths. Then, Angie started to notice that Gracie would become very upset and would beg not to take baths. And it wasn't until Gracie went to her mother with these horrifying allegations that Angie would actually figure out why. Without quoting her directly, because it's very, very disturbing, Gracie told her mom that her dad was sexually abusing her during bath time by putting soap inside of her and that he was really, really hurting her. Angie confronted Aaron about this and allegedly, now I'm going to be saying allegedly throughout pretty much the whole video, but either way, allegedly, he did admit to Angie that it was true, but apparently, he told Angie that if she told anybody about it, that he was going to take her children away from her. At this time, Angie was starting to see her own therapist, a therapist named Dr. Reed, to try and come up with a plan to try to get away from Aaron. She started taking notes on her phone of the different incidences and emailing back and forth with her therapist to try to formulate a plan. This whole time, I want to note that Gracie alleges that her grandparents or Angie's parents knew about the abuse coming from Aaron, but they continued to support him for one reason or another. And we will see more of that in just a minute. I just wanted to put that out there so when I mention what I'm going to mention next, it kind of makes more sense to you. By May of 2013, things would come to even a worse level than they ever had been before. Now, before this, Angie, Grant, and Gracie all started to sleep together in the master bedroom without their father. They would also go in the master bedroom and lock themselves away whenever Aaron would have these angry outbursts. On this day, on May 9th, 2013, the same thing happened where he had this angry outburst and everybody tried getting away from him, so Angie took herself and the kids away from Aaron in the master bedroom. However, at some point during all of this, Aaron called Angie into the bathroom where he allegedly hit her on the side of the head and then started strangling her with a cord of a hair dryer. As all of this was happening, Grant apparently walked in and witnessed his dad strangling his mother. So he was able to step in and he was able to stop Aaron from allegedly trying to kill Angie. Angie was able to get out of the house in that moment, but neither Angie or Grant ever reported anything. Angie said that she was too scared to report it herself, you know, understandably, and she told Grant also not to tell anybody because she was afraid for his safety as well. However, it turned out that Aaron actually did call 911 to report this incident. Angie stated that her parents had come over and spoke with Aaron, and that is when they called 911 to report that Angie had just attempted to take her own life by hanging herself with the blow dryer cord. So, it was stated by Angie that Aaron and Angie's parents made her go to the hospital and get treatment at the Parthenon Centennial Hospital, sticking with the story that Angie is just very mentally ill and she tried to kill herself. Once she was able to get with the doctor alone, Angie actually told the doctor that the story just is not true. She said that she didn't try to take her own life. She explained that Aaron was very abusive and that he tried to kill her that night. So, she stayed the night at the hospital and she was advised to get a restraining order against Aaron, and she did. But when she got home on May 11th, Angie found that the house was completely empty. Aaron and the children were all gone. She tried contacting her parents, Aaron's parents, and Aaron, none of which would answer her repeated phone calls. The following day on May 12th, it was Mother's Day, so she was hoping that, you know, he was going to bring home the children on this day at least to see her on Mother's Day. So she waited, but the next thing she knows, instead of Aaron and the children showing up, the police show up at her house. It turned out that Aaron called 911 once again and told the police that Angie was suicidal. But the police here did not think that there was any sign whatsoever that she actually was suicidal. They agreed that she probably was in an abusive relationship and they left without taking any further action. 
Now I'm going to read the medical report from the night that Angie spent at the hospital. It reads, These mental health records indicated that Dr. Solomon was seen at Centennial Medical Center for suicidal ideation. The record indicated that her stay was less than 24 hours. The psychiatric evaluation noted that Dr. Solomon was brought by the paramedics and accompanied by her husband and her parents. The note indicated that the staff admitted her out of caution despite the confusing presentation of abuse versus a suicide attempt. The note suggested that Dr. Solomon was likely in an abusive relationship with her husband. It also indicated that she was likely mistreated as a child by her parents. The admitting physician, Michael Murphy, MD, according to the chart, spoke with Dr. Solomon's outpatient psychiatrist who stated that the plan was for Dr. Solomon to move out of the house and obtain a divorce. The chart indicated that Dr. Solomon did not appear to have any signs of depression and she was not voicing suicidal ideation. The chart indicated that the outpatient psychiatrist confirmed that the patient has not had a previous suicide attempt. The admitting physician documented that it does not appear that there is any evidence that the patient tried to hang herself, and I do not believe that she is in an acute mood state that would lead to suicide. She was admitted with the diagnosis of major depression in remission and given a global assessment of functioning score of 65. In the hospital course of the discharge summary, it was noted that the patient was telling the truth about the situation and she was in a risky situation with her husband, who appeared to possibly be volatile and violent, although this was uncertain. The patient's parents also appeared to be unreliable sources of information. It was noted that Dr. Solomon was calm and cooperative with the assessment and admission process. The chart indicated that Dr. Solomon was was not started on new medication. She was discharged on the same outpatient medication schedule. So clearly, as we can see from her admitting doctor's note, there was no concern for her having any sort of suicidal ideation or actions at any point. There was no concern that she was a harm to herself or anybody else around her. Clearly, the note indicates that she may be in an abusive situation and that neither her husband nor her parents are reliable witnesses. At this point, Angie had already gotten a restraining order against Aaron. However, days passed and she still hadn't heard anything about the whereabouts of him or her children. She still tried calling the police about this, but it doesn't seem like they were willing to do much of anything at this point. It actually turned out that while Angie was staying overnight at the hospital, Aaron had filed for divorce and filed an order of protection against Angie for himself and his children. And I believe it was at this point that Aaron was granted full custody of Gracie and Grant. For the following months, Grant and Gracie were stuck with their father while Angie fought as hard as she possibly could to get them back. Gracie would go on to say that neither of them wanted to live with Aaron. He was strict and they were in a constant state of fear due to his psychological and physical abuse. He also was strict on their diets. He allowed no sugar and I believe they could only eat meat and vegetables. A friend of Grant's said that during the first year that he lived with his father, he noticed that Grant was losing a lot of weight. He became noticeably skinny and frail, and he actually lost 25 pounds that year. There was even one incident where Aaron and Grant were driving, with obviously Aaron driving the car, and Grant tried to escape by jumping out of the moving car. But Aaron had grabbed Grant by the wrist so hard that Grant thought that he broke his wrist. And Gracie would go on to say that even years and years later, she noticed that Grant would often like hold his wrist, the same wrist that Aaron had grabbed. So it's very possible that he actually injured him. The hearing for divorce took place on June 21st, 2013, appearing before Judge Philip E. Smith. Aaron was represented by two attorneys named David Scott and Michael Parsley, and Angie was represented by Joni Aberthony. At the hearing, Aaron got Angie's father to testify against her, and he also got Angie's sister to make a statement against her as well. However, medical experts who examined Angie testified for her, saying that they believed, based on their evidence, saying that she is not suicidal, she did not try to kill herself, and she is, in fact, the victim of domestic abuse. However, at the end of the hearing, Judge Smith ruled in Aaron's favor. For the following six months, Angie contacted her counselor more and more to figure out what to do now. 
And again, she was doing anything that she could to document any sort of abuse, neglect, and manipulation that Aaron had done to them. By 2014, the court finally allowed Angie two hours of supervised visits per week. Aaron finally let Angie visit the children, and at this time, she noticed that her children just did not look good. Once again, Grant had lost a ton of weight, and she noticed that Gracie's eyes had huge discolored bags under them. Clearly, these children were suffering, they were tired, and the physical signs were clearly there. The courts told Angie that she couldn't have any actual parenting time with her children until she got a full psychiatric evaluation, which she did. The report said that there is ample evidence that Angie is a fully capable parent. The report reads, quote, there is no data to indicate that Dr. Solomon is at risk of harming her children. The collateral sources, her self-report, and the report of her husband contain no information that suggests she might be abusive, neglectful, or harmful to the children. Then Dr. Reed, the psychiatrist who had been evaluating and treating Angie for years, he told the courts that her prognosis is excellent and that Aaron has manipulated the courts into thinking that her mental health was a lot worse than it actually was. He told the courts that the children had made multiple comments, both of them about the abuse that they had suffered at the hands of Aaron. But still, Aaron kept custody of the children, though Angie could visit them for six hours a week. By November of 2014, Gracie told her mother that her father was still sexually abusing her. Over the course of the next few months, now going into 2015, Gracie told her mother more and more about the abuse. She said that there were times where she would randomly become very, very sleepy and she wouldn't remember anything until she would wake up in her dad's bed. She would wake up with her legs and her private parts burning but she could never remember why. There was also a time where Gracie found time to FaceTime her mother without Aaron noticing, and when doing so, she showed her mom that she had a bunch of bruises on her inner thighs, but she couldn't remember how exactly she got them. Aaron told Gracie that this was a rash from her swimming suit, but she knew that this just was not true. Other allegations she said was that, you know, if her and Grant were driving with Aaron and either one of them said something that upset Aaron, that he would start driving really fast just to scare them. He would also tell them that, you know, their mother's house isn't safe, and at one point, he told them that Angie was actually dead, and they believed it for years. Now, during this time, Aaron had received a trust fund worth over a million dollars from an aunt who had passed away. He had been receiving payments of about $100,000 per month for several months at this point. However, by April of 2015, Aaron reported to the police that Angie was not paying child support, so she was arrested. I mentioned this trust fund because he clearly was making enough money so that she didn't have to pay child support. He clearly had enough to take care of his children, but he still called the police. So she took this as a threat to keep quiet about the abuse that she was now finding out about. Angie spent the following three years just trying to appease Aaron, stay quiet, and fight for her and her children's safety. She continued to contact people in law enforcement to tell them that she is afraid for her and her children's safety. She contacted multiple members of their church. She contacted DCS and even members of their school, the Grace Christian Academy. Angie found out that Aaron may have also been grooming other young students at their high school, and she tried telling the staff members about that as well, but they always just seemed to write her off. By August of 2018, Grant and Gracie ran away from the home where they lived with Aaron for the first time, but Aaron quickly called the police and tracked down the both of them and brought them both back to Aaron. Aaron specifically requested that the police drive them back to his house so that they would be scared and that they would learn their lesson never to disobey him ever again. By the weekend of August 17th and 18th, 2018, Grant had a baseball tournament in North Carolina. At the same time, Angie had also filed for an emergency custody hearing citing dependent neglect and abuse against Aaron. 
That weekend, Grant stayed at the tournament, but Gracie and Aaron had to return back to Tennessee for the custody hearing. As they were driving back to Tennessee from North Carolina, Aaron booked a hotel room to stay the night, which only had one bed, even though Gracie had protested this and asked her dad specifically to get one with two beds. Gracie said that that night, they had to share that bed, and that night, Aaron had raped her. After that, when they went to the court hearing, Gracie told the court what her dad did to her just that previous night. She described everything that had happened in great detail, and Gracie describes that her dad's lawyer got in her face and was trying to tell her that she didn't actually remember what she thought she did. He told her that her dad actually didn't do anything to her and that she was remembering something that just did not happen. Once again, the family alleged all of the abuse that the children suffered. Grant had also wrote a letter to the courts about the abuse that he faced by his father. Grant said that he was terrified of his father. His father restricted his food, restricted when he could use the bathroom. He humiliated him, calling him fat and making him work for baseball constantly without any breaks. Grant said that Aaron only cared about him as a reflection of his own parenting excellence, which people could see through Grant's baseball talents. He said that his dad would lie about his mom, saying that she was mentally ill, but it wasn't true. He said that he had proof that she wasn't mentally ill, but the courts just would not listen. He said that him and Gracie both want to be with their mom, and that every moment that they're with their father, they are terrified. But at the end of it, Williamson County Circuit Court Judge Deanna Johnson dismissed the petition once again, saying that it was filed without merit. She also ruled that Angie could not file any further civil lawsuits against Aaron for a period of six years. She basically just did not believe what Gracie was saying and she didn't believe anything that Angie was saying and was thinking that, you know, Angie was filing all of these different motions just to get back at Aaron for whatever reason. So, Gracie was sent back with her dad to go drive back to North Carolina to pick up her brother. As this was ruled, she was visibly terrified after this ruling. Visibly terrified but nobody cared. Now, I want to note that Aaron goes to the same church as many high-level members of their court system in their county in Tennessee, including their governor, Bill Lee. They all attended Grace Chapel Church. Aaron had been going there for several years, and his children, Gracie and Grant, went to the school within the same building. They were separate entities, but they were all in the same building, and people at the church and at the school all sort of subscribed to the same ideologies. People at the church all thought that Aaron was a good guy who goes to church, gives back, and is a great father, and it seems that through all of these court hearings, including this one, it has been said that there is an ongoing bias with all of these different people through law enforcement, the courts, and the governments who are all inclined to believe Aaron because they all attend the same church, therefore have the same ideologies. Then, in this specific case, to add to that, it was said that Judge Johnson had spoken with the pastor of their church shortly before the ruling, so Angie thinks that there's some sort of bias there as well. I will speak more on this later in the video, but it's thought that this entire time, the courts and law enforcement and all of these people just thought that, you know, Angie was going out there to try and get back at her husband, that she was filing all of these things just to make him look bad. And, you know, they were believing Aaron because even though her children were also alleging these things, he went to church, so he has to be a great guy. By May of that year, Gracie was actually set to live with a family friend under DCS care but her father was still allowed some sort of custody. There was a picture of Grant and a friend, I believe, celebrating in court that they no longer had to live with their father, but this was very short-lived because he still had more custody than their mother. This whole time throughout this entire thing, Gracie had also tried speaking with staff members at her high school, Grace Christian Academy, about the abuse that her father was putting her through. However, in one day at school, the principal called Gracie into the office for a meeting 
where they advised her to stop talking about the abuse in order to save her reputation. But after finding this out, Grant had had enough. He said that he was going to stop going to school until he got a meeting with the principal. Once that meeting was granted, once again, he says, or Angie says, that they justified their actions, that they were just trying to protect Gracie's reputation. Gracie also tried talking about all of this to a school counselor, but once again, nothing was done. Grant also went to the school's pastor and tried to tell him about the abuse, but once again, nobody did anything. All of this is alleged by Angie, but all of these stories came out from Gracie and Grant, who told their mother about this, that nobody was doing anything despite them telling everybody that they could. All of the trusted adults that they thought they could trust, nobody was doing anything about it. So I will once again get more into this later in the video, but that is what they allege. Then finally, we get to the part of this case where everything comes to a head. On the morning of Monday, July 20th, 2020, 18-year-old Grant had driven an hour to school at Grace Christian Academy for baseball practice. At this point, again, I believe they were living with a family friend, so that is why they lived so far away, but it is important to note that he did drive an hour. That morning, he arrived to the parking lot and started getting ready for his practice, but just 15 minutes before practice, Grant had been struck by his own truck and he was killed. And there was one witness to this incident, and by now, you should have guessed it, it was Aaron. Aaron was the only witness to Grant's supposed accidental death. So at around 8.44 a.m. that same day, Aaron called 911 from the parking lot to report the incident. He initially said that Grant had parked his truck at his practice location at the Ward Performance Center Institute in Gallatin, Tennessee. He said that he parked his own car and was actually looking at his phone when he noticed that Grant's truck was no longer parked next to him. After that, he heard a loud crash. He said that he then watched the truck as it started to roll back down the hill and into the ditch, hitting Grant and dragging him with the truck. When the police arrived and took his statement, he told the police at this point that he saw Grant get out of the truck, go around the truck to go to the bed of the truck and grab his baseball gear out of the bed. Then he said that he saw the truck start backing up and then hit Grant and drag Grant and go all the way once again to the ditch, trapping Grant underneath the car in that ditch. In the call, Aaron said that there were three other people who witnessed the incident, but it was never brought up again after this. He said, I've got three guys here, but he later reported that he was the only person present to witness this incident. I will play this 911 call now, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think about it. I'm trying. Where's your emergency? It's 1357 South Water Street. It's off 109. Please hurry. You said 57? Please hurry. Okay, what's 1357. going on? 1357. Uh, my, my son's truck backed over him, and he, it's rolled over him and dragged him into the ditch, and it's on top of him. He's trapped under the truck, and I... I yeah, he, I, he uh, somehow it drug him underneath it. Yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to, no, I'm, I'm trying to call 911. Okay, what's your name? Oh, my God. My name is Aaron Solomon. And you said oh my God. 1357 Southwater Avenue, right? Yes. How old yes. is the male? He's 18. He just turned 18 a couple of weeks, about a month ago my son. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is not good. Is he awake? And oh, please hurry. You? I don't know. I don't think so. He's not, uh, he's not alert, right? No, he's out. And he's trapped. I got three guys here, and he's trapped under the truck. Okay. Oh, my God. I understand, sir. Stay on the phone with me while we get somebody out there. What's your name? Aaron Solomon. All right, Aaron. Huh? What kind of vehicle is it? It's a Toyota Tacoma, Tacoma, and it the the vehicle has to. He's underneath the vehicle. Okay, I've got and the, that. And, and it's. 
Okay, I've got that. What color is it? It's a white truck. That's my son. He, it, somehow it backed up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on one. I'm on with nine one one right now. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Was your son working on it? No, no, he was just getting out of it. It's the hill. It's we're on an incline, and I guess he didn't have it in park or something, or it wasn't engaged, or. Oh my god! Oh Is my your god! Son I can't still believe not this. responding. No, no. And he's still under no. truck. No one can get yes. him out from under. No, it's no. We saw it's, units and route to you. I'm just asking you questions for we can huh? update him, okay? Can you check and see huh? he's breathing? I, I, somebody's telling me that he's coming too. Okay, maybe. He is, is waking up, maybe. Kind, of, kind of keeping still. So he is. Well, he breathing. can't. Yeah, he can't move. I don't think he can move. I I don't know. Okay, I no, he can't move. He's trapped. Okay, well, we got somebody in route. Now, when he wakes I, up, he might I'm be telling scared. Him, then somebody I'm get down him. there and talk to him. Yeah, somebody talk to him. There. Shit. You see, there's blood. What, is he facing up or down? He's facing up. They said he may aspirate. We need to hurry. Oh, my God. So does he have blood coming out of his mouth? Yeah, he's, yeah there's blood coming out. Yeah, somehow it drug him down, I think. I don't know whether it wasn't in park or what, or if it didn't engage the brake, or it drug him underneath somehow. Okay. They said he's facing up. Okay. But he's bleeding from his mouth. So, Grant, turn your face to the side if you can, barely, but be careful. Don't move him, okay? We can't move him. We can't. We can't move him. All right, these and they're there. I'm gonna let you go, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Uh huh. Bye bye. Personally, in this 911 call, I think he sounds really calm. He keeps saying that Grant is trapped but he never actually went over to the truck and look under it to see that he was actually trapped. There was a witness at the scene who saw things like after the incident happened, nobody actually saw the truck rolling over Grant, but there was someone who came out and saw that Aaron was on the phone with the dispatchers and the witness said that he saw Aaron, you know, standing on the top of the hill, looking down at Aaron from the top of the hill and that he never actually went over to the truck to see if he was really trapped or if he could, you know, pull him out or anything like that. That is what this other witness said. He said that Aaron was just pacing back and forth as he was on this 911 call. So that's all to say that, you know, this witness basically told us his behaviors and his mannerisms during the call. And once again, he didn't actually go over to Grant to try to help him or to see if he was really stuck under there. He just sort of watched from afar. To me, in the call, he sounds very calm and collected. Not frantic at all like you'd expect for someone who just witnessed this truck roll over and trap his son. Once again, we can't really judge anybody based on how they respond to tragedy or how they respond to certain situations, but you'd expect a little bit more urgency in his voice, at least in my opinion. Again, you guys let me know what you hear and what you think, but that's just my thoughts on this call so far. I don't think it sounds right. Ambulances arrived shortly after this call. According to the police reports, when they got there, Grant had been laying on his back underneath of the front of the truck, and he had been between the tires, so the tires weren't actually putting any weight on his body at the time. He was bleeding from his scalp, his nose, and his ears. He was initially unresponsive when they found him, but he was still breathing at the time, though he was barely alive. Paramedics removed him from the bottom of the truck, put him into the ambulance, and began CPR. However, 
by the time they reached the hospital at 9.30 a.m., he was pronounced dead. According to the hospital staff, he was found to have one laceration on the back of his skull, which had been bleeding. Then he had three bruises, one to his jaw, one to his left hip, and the other near his right thigh. He did have a head injury, but his cause of death was determined to be a cardiac arrest. The police took down Aaron's report and he met with them at the hospital where Grant was and he was given paperwork to fill out. Aaron declined to get Grant an autopsy and he declined to have his organs donated. This paperwork was completed before Angie even got to the hospital and she was not considered in any of these decisions. Angie said that this really, really frustrated her, obviously, because, you know, maybe she would have wanted an autopsy or something, but also because she said that a lot of Grant's organs were perfectly usable, that they could have been donated to save other people's lives, but Aaron decided that he wasn't going to donate the organs, and this was not something that Angie agreed with. But either way, just as quickly as this case was opened, police closed the case and they moved on his death was ruled an accidental death. However, there's a lot to this whole situation that just does not sit right with Angie, Gracie, or their supporters, and I can absolutely see why. First, the story of him being dragged through the grass under the truck just does not make sense with the injuries that he sustained. He only had one laceration to the back of his head and three other bruises, like I said, on his jaw, his hip, and his thigh. That is it. He had no scrapes, no scratches, no marks from supposedly being dragged across the pavement, rocks, and grass. Then we know that the car had been driven an hour to get to practice. By that point, the car would have been hot. He wasn't there for long before he got hit by the truck, so the car would have still been hot. Yet, there are no burn marks on his body. There's no sign of blood or burn marks or even scuff marks on the asphalt. There was no blood on the asphalt where he most likely would have hit his head and sustained the head injury that he was bleeding from. There was absolutely no blood anywhere on the asphalt. Here is a figure that shows Grant's height compared to the truck. He is 6'3", and he was apparently backed up and over by the truck, got pinned under, even though it was reported that the weight of the tires were never on him. If he had been hit by the truck like that and dragged underneath, you'd expect bruising on his back, his buttocks, and the front of his abdomen. You'd expect scrape and scratch marks. Then, if it had backed up and hit him, you'd expect that this is where he would fall backwards and hit his head. It wouldn't have happened at any other time because, again, the blunt force is what would have caused him to fall back and hit his head. Yet, once again, there are no marks or blood on the asphalt. You'd expect that if he was bleeding, from a head wound, which heads bleed a lot. If you've ever seen like someone with a little cut on their head, it's like dripping and they look like they've had like a horrible, horrible injury, even though it might just be like, you know, a cut that's pretty bad, but it's not going to be anything that's like life-threatening. If he got a cut to the back of his head, you'd expect there to be blood marks. You'd expect it to be dragged across the asphalt or at the very least, one spot of blood but there was nothing. Then we have this picture of the shoes that Granton was wearing when all of this took place. They are totally clean. There's no scuff marks or dirt on his shoes or socks, even though his body was allegedly dragged through rocks, grass, and dirt. Then we have the photos from the scene. The story, once again, is that the car started in the parking lot, backed over the grass that we see here, and then ended up in this ditch with the tires on the sidewalk all while dragging Grant's body. However, when EMTs arrived, Grant was found under his truck with his body facing towards the front of the truck and his head pointed towards the building. So, if he were backed up into and dragged, he would have been hit and he would have fallen back with his head pointed towards the road. There's absolutely no way he would have fallen the other direction. So, if this is the building and this is the road and this is the way the truck is backing up and this is Grant, he would have fallen this way. So, if this is his head, 
it would have been towards the road, but he was found with his head towards the building, so the completely opposite way. I could definitely see how he might have ended up like being dragged to the front of the truck if this really was what situation that happened. I could see that if he was dragged under the truck that he might have, you know, slid up near the front of the truck. That part I can see, but somehow while being dragged this six foot three body did a complete 180 turn and somehow ended up facing the complete opposite way than when he was hit once again just to show you how ridiculous that is people are trying to say that grant fell this way was dragged under the truck and at some point during all of it he went like this his body completely turned the opposite way and was found a complete 180 from where he had fallen and how he was hit. That makes absolutely zero sense. Then once again, when we look at the scene photos, there are no truck tracks through the grass. The grass is still standing and looks undamaged. No matter what angle you look at, the grass looks like it had not been driven through, let alone a body dragged through. Then we see that there are tire marks on the sidewalk leading to the ditch. The tire marks are a clear indication that the car had driven forward onto the sidewalk. Once again, there are no tire marks in the parking lot where allegedly he was dragged. There's no scuff marks on the asphalt in the parking lot, once again, where he was allegedly dragged but there are on the sidewalks that showed that the car drove forward. Then they found that Grant's glasses were up on the sidewalk. Grant always wore his glasses and he could not see without them. So clearly at some point, he was standing on the sidewalk and either dropped his glasses or they were knocked off of him somehow or someone took his glasses from him and put him on the sidewalk for whatever reason. They weren't in the parking lot where Grant was allegedly hit by the car. Once again, if Grant's here in the parking lot and he falls back and his glasses fall off at any point, it would have been when he fell. It makes no sense that his glasses would have stayed on him that entire time as he's being dragged and then after he's pinned under the car, his glasses somehow fly off of his face and land on the sidewalk make it make sense. Then we see that there is a bloody rock found next to the front driver's side door in that ditch. The one injury that Grant had where he was bleeding was when he suffered blunt force trauma to the head. Yet, as we said, there's no blood on that pavement, only on the rock in this ditch. So, did he hit his head on this rock where there's clearly blood found? or did he hit his head on the pavement like Aaron said? Then if this truck backed all the way up into the ditch, you'd expect a lot of major damage to the truck. When I first saw these photos after hearing the story, that is something that immediately struck me when I saw the scene photos without reading anything else. That car looks completely fine. The only thing wrong with that car is that the bumper, the back bumper, is slightly damaged, but that's it. According to experts, the back bumper on a Toyota Tacoma is easily breakable. That's like the one thing that owners of this truck complain about, that the back bumper is designed to break at only minor collisions. When EMTs arrived to the scene, they immediately used a jack to lift the car up and get Grant's body out from under. The jack would have caused the back bumper to make contact with the sidewalk and that could have been what caused this very minor damage. Once again, the story is that it backed up all the way across the parking lot, slammed into that ditch so hard that it kept going up the other side of the ditch. It doesn't just happen that easily. You see how deep that ditch is. It's not just going to go in and slowly go back on the other side. It's going to go in, slam on the ground, and come up before it actually ends up on the other side of the sidewalk. It's not just going to do it gently to cause no damage. There would have been a lot more damage to that car if this was the story of it backing up and going into that ditch and ending up the way that it did. I think that the story that is being told would have caused a hell of a lot more damage to that car than we see on that car. So that is everything that is wrong with the scene. Then to add to that, after this incident, 
The truck was returned to Aaron's driveway, where it was kept until the following year. By February of 2021, Angie found out that that truck had been sent off to a scrapyard in Nashville. This picture of the truck is how the truck looked after the incident. There's almost no damage to the truck and definitely not anything to make scrapping it warranted. Luckily, Angie was able to get a hold of the truck and after forensic examination, it was found that the accident could not have happened the way Aaron described it. I don't know the details of that. I don't know the details of the forensic examination or who actually performed it but that is the conclusion that Angie said that they came to. Yet, through all of this history of domestic violence allegations, his son dying, his daughter claiming to be raped and abused, and the scene just not adding up, the car being found not to be consistent with the story, Grant's injuries not being consistent with the story, the Gallatin Police Department will not open up an investigation. The family believes that there is foul play at the hands of Aaron. Grant had literally just freshly turned 18, literally a month before this, and he had always stuck up for Gracie and always had full intention of doing whatever he could to protect her. Now that he was 18, he was an adult, and maybe now he'd be taken more seriously in the courts and in the church. The family thought that Aaron drove the truck over the sidewalk where Grant may have been standing and hit Grant so that he fell back and hit his head on this rock and then left the car there over him, killing Grant. All to kill Grant and stop him from exposing Aaron for the abuser that he allegedly is. If you look at the scene and Grant's injuries, and everything else that I told you. Try to explain both scenarios in your head. Just intuitively, which one makes more sense? Him being dragged across the parking lot, his whole body completely turning around and suffering no scratches, burns, bruises, and him being trapped under the car even though the tires were not pinning him under, and him dying of cardiac arrest, or being terrified that his dad hit him with his own truck, being struck on the sidewalk, falling in the direction that he was found, hitting his head on a rock which was found to have blood on it, and then dying of cardiac arrest because he was terrified of his abusive father. Which one makes more sense to you? You have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to say that the first one makes more sense than the second one. So, by May 12th of 2021, 14-year-old Gracie decided not to allow these secrets and lies to go on any further. She posted an 18-minute long video to YouTube where she alleges everything that happened to her from the time that she was a child. I will try to put in as many clips of this as I can, so long as I don't have any copyright issues. If I can't include it in the video, of course, it will be listed down below. She states that her father is a liar, a manipulator, and violent. He has tried to kill her mom, he has hurt her, and she believes that Aaron killed Grant and is going to kill her. She said that for the prior two years before Grant's death, she set boundaries with him after going to therapy with him, and he actually has mostly stuck to them. The abuse has pretty much almost all stopped. But after the death, it was right back to where it was. Gracie said that Aaron will just show up at her house and come inside to hug her or touch her hair. He constantly tries to get her to come with him to his house and she always has to say no. He will find her friends and take videos of them and send them to Gracie. She said that they do have a restraining order in place, but he's not listening. He's still showing up to the school. He's still trying to get back into contact with her and she just has not been able to catch a break from him. After this video was posted, the court bench ordered Gracie into DCF custody due to fear of psychological harm. Angie said that this is something that's pretty much completely unprecedented. Even though all she wanted was to live with her mother, to get away from her abusive father, and to get justice for her brother. There is also another video posted on this YouTube channel by a friend of Gracie's who also alleges a lot of things that she knows that Gracie went through. There is also another YouTube page called Justice for Grant, I believe, where they 
basically go through the scene and everything in different videos to point out all of the inconsistencies. Of course, both of those will be listed down below as well. After the video was posted, Aaron filed a defamation lawsuit against Angie and a group of Gracie's friends, claiming that all of the allegations that Gracie made in that video are completely false. He claimed that after several attempts at defaming Aaron in the courts, Angie took to social media to extort Aaron into giving up his custody and raising money for herself. I read the lawsuit and everything in this video that I discussed all the way from the abuse allegations from Gracie and Grant to him being diagnosed as a sex addict and a, you know, narcissist and him being fired from his sports anchor job for having inappropriate things on his computer. He said that every single bit of that information is false. So that is why at the beginning of the video, I made that disclaimer that all of this is alleged once again for legal purposes. None of this is true. It's all alleged based on information that I was able to find on public platforms. None of this is absolutely true. It's alleged by people involved and Aaron claims that all of this is false. Angie and her team filed an appeal to this under the pretense that they have their rights to free speech and Aaron did end up withdrawing his lawsuit, but as of last year, 2022, it is said that his legal team is planning to refile the lawsuit at a federal level. So, as far as I've seen, this is all the information that I know about this part of the case. I believe Gracie is still in DCS custody, and it seems like nothing, absolutely nothing, has happened to Aaron. All of those who Angie has accused of ignoring all three of them in their cries and pleas for help, they have all declined to comment. That includes the church as well as the schools that Gracie attended. Now, the school claims that they actually had no idea about the abuse allegations whatsoever. However, on the Freedom for Gracie website, there are screenshots of posted conversations where she proves that multiple people within the church, courts, and school all agreed to meetings and that, you know, this is where they said they were told about the abuse allegations. They denied all of the things that I mentioned in this video, but there is information that may be able to prove that they knew about the allegations. If you want to see more of these specific screenshots and specific conversations, click on the timeline part of the website, Freedom for Gracie, and you will see a very, very detailed timeline and all of the receipts for everything that we discussed in today's video. I feel like it would be a little bit overwhelming if I went through the information and then also had a section where I like read off the conversations and named all these different people and talked about all of the receipts. I'm just giving you the information and if you want like confirmation of everything and you want to double check and you want to check what I have told you, go ahead to their website and they post all of the different receipts and they explain it in much greater detail than I did. Either way, all of these people denied that they knew anything about these allegations. They denied that they ignored them and they denied that they ever even really knew. So, that's where that's at right now. Like I said, all of these different people and entities say that they didn't know about the allegations. They say that they were never told about the allegations and they declined that anything, you know, about them having this inaction or whatever. They said none of that is true. They also obviously denied that they all spoke to one another and that they were all, you know, believing Aaron only because he attends their church. They denied all of those allegations. As of right now, both Gracie and her mother are both fighting for Gracie freedom. The fact that she is still under DCS care and is still having to fight to get away from her abuser and be with her mother. So, there is a whole website dedicated to this case, like I said, which details every single step in the timeline from when Angie met Aaron until now. There's a page that details the scene of Grant's death, all of the police and hospital reports, those involved in ignoring their cries for help, and information about who each person is. So, if you want to find out more about this case and you want to look at everything for yourself, please make sure you go ahead and check out that website. It's a great website. I'm so impressed with whoever set it up. It's all-encompassing and has everything that you need to know about this case. So, if you do want more information about this case, go ahead and check out that website. There is also an Instagram page as well as a GoFundMe, which is still active. The money from the GoFundMe is going to help support Gracie in her legal battles as she fights with the court systems and DCS to get justice for herself and her brother. 
If you do have anything to donate, please consider donating to her GoFundMe, which of course will be listed down below. There is also a change.org petition that is so, so close to hitting that 10,000 signatures, so please take a moment and sign the petition. It's petitioning for police to start investigating Grant's death based on the information that was initially ignored and overlooked in this investigation. So please go ahead and sign that and let people know that you still want this case investigated. But as of right now, that is all I know about this case. I am very, 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 very frustrated about how all of this went down and is still going down. I don't know what I think about the courts and the school and the church all covering for Aaron. I personally believe that through all of this, I don't think that they believed that he was abusive. I think that Aaron had all of them convinced that the children are covering for their mom because she is mentally ill and is just trying to do whatever they can to make Aaron look as bad as possible. I don't want to believe that all of these people knew about the abuse and believe that he is an abuser and are still covering for him. I personally think that Aaron just has all of these people convinced that Angie is a liar and that his children are too. I personally think that Aaron has made Angie look crazy enough, crazy enough to these people to make them actually believe that she is suicidal, that she just wants to make Aaron look as bad as possible, and that she wants her children in her own custody so that she can get back at Aaron. I personally think that those people all believed that because they knew Aaron personally, but I honestly don't see a reason for Gracie to just make these things up. There's no reason to put yourself out there like she has and discuss the horrendous things that she has been brave enough to tell us. It's sick to think that a 14-year-old girl, her friends, and her mother would all just go out there and say all these things just for the purpose of destroying someone's credibility. People in the courts who are unbiased and have no skin in the game testify that Angie was most likely being abused and so were her children. People whose jobs it is to give only the facts on what they have found in their patients and using their degree and their medical expertise to come up with a conclusion. Those are the people that testified for Angie. The fact that the courts believed the one person who had the most to lose and the most to gain, Aaron, over medical professionals who pretty much had no skin in the game other than protecting their patients is just beyond me. The fact that you're going to believe someone who clearly is biased, obviously, no matter how good of a person you are, you're going to be biased and wanting your children and wanting to do whatever is best for yourself over the other person. So the fact that the courts are believing this person and people who are biased and not the people who are unbiased and it is their job to be unbiased is just beyond me. Unfortunately, I do think that Gracie is the victim of horrible, horrible abuse and a horrible system that is in place and that she truly has suffered from all of this. I believe everything that she's told us and I think that we all need to be out there fighting for justice for her. I also personally believe that Grant's death was not as Aaron described it. I don't know if it was a premeditated type of thing. The scene and the fact that it was where there could have been a lot of witnesses and the fact that it was in broad daylight makes me think that it was more a heat of the moment type of thing. I think that Aaron met Grant there because Gracie said earlier in her video that Aaron would go to every single one of Grant's baseball games to go watch him and make sure that he's doing well enough. I think that maybe Aaron and his dad got into Grant's truck, maybe to have a conversation or something like that. Maybe Aaron wanted to talk to Grant or maybe Grant told his dad to get into the truck so that they could have a personal conversation to confront him. But I think either way, at some point within this whole thing, I think there was an argument. I think that Grant, because he turned freshly 18 again, literally a month before that, Grant told his dad that he was going to expose him now that people are going to take him seriously. I think that if they had this conversation in the truck, maybe Aaron lashed out and tried to physically hurt Grant or something like that or said something that just really upset Grant and Grant got out of the truck and maybe his dad chased him down with the truck or something like that. I don't know for sure, but I think somehow in all of this, Grant got out of the truck and Aaron was still driving. Again, we don't know exactly how because Aaron's really the only person that knows how this went down, but I think that Grant at some point ended up on the sidewalk. Then Aaron was on the road and drove over the sidewalk and hit Grant head on, causing him to fall into the ditch and was killed that way. Again, we don't know the details. We don't know how exactly or why, 
but I think that Aaron was hit on that sidewalk and I think that was how he was killed. All of the evidence points towards that being the scenario and all of the evidence points directly away from the situation that Aaron described. The fact that the scene was how it was and nothing matches up and again with all of these other accusations, it is insane to me that the police will not reopen this investigation. I don't know if they're also buddies with Aaron somehow or if they're lazy and they just don't think that there's enough to open a case or whatever, but there is so, so, so much to show that something else is going on here and it needs to be further looked into. I want those in this town to know that we still care about Gracie and Grant. People out there need to know that they have supporters out there who care about what happens in this case. So please, if you want to follow this case and support Angie and her children, please follow the Freedom for Gracie Instagram page, sign the petition, donate to their GoFundMe, and check out their website. Let them know that we hear them. Let them know that we support them. But either way, that is where I am going to end today's video and I really, really want to hear your guys' thoughts on this one. What do you think about the allegations that Gracie has stated? Do you think that Aaron truly is the abuser that his family says he is? What do you think about the church and the court's involvement in all of this? What do you think about Grant's death? Do you think this is an accident or do you think there is more to this or do you think that it's exactly how Aaron stated it? Let me know all of your thoughts in the comments down below. But either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions over to my Google Doc, which will be listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.